We can see it. Okay. So, okay, I, I, I want to begin by also making the land acknowledgement. I know it's been done, but we can't do it more than enough, I think. We need to recognize the land on which we are, um, where we have been and where we want to go. We also want to recognize our ancestors and the elders, um, both who are present and those who are uh, spiritually, because they're in a different world. Um, uh, for me, part of, and uh, Shanika mentioned a question of um, my chief status in, in Ghana. I, I come from the Asechi clan, which is one of the 11 clans of the Asante. Um, and within this clan membership, our animal spirit is the vulture. And one of the things about the vulture is the teachings, right? You know, the vulture hides its communities on the rubbish dump. Uh, but there's a saying in our clan that Finipari uh, Nama Idika. Literally, what that means is that family runs deep, family, family is very deep. And also, the essence of community that community would always be community if you want it to be. And I think these are the teachings that I work with uh, from that uh, ancestral clan membership. I also want to thank the um, Demo Badidil learning institute and all the folks who have been involved uh, right from Syria, Georgia and the rest uh, and also Janine Devo for, for that fellowship in Afrocentric research and I know it offers a space for us to think about how we talk about school family uh, community partnerships so in this particular case African and Nova Scotian community partnerships uh, but also it allows me given that I'm also the director for the center for integrative anti-racism studies at OISI to draw this partnership, which goes more beyond questions of presentations, but research uh, and, and, and student uh, uh, mentorship along the process, but also how we engage communities in, in questions of schooling. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I think you have a number of you who are on, um, in the room at the moment, and I, I noticed that, um, for example, uh, one of our African distinguished scholars of Kukwa is in the room. Um, and I just want to make this point about a lot of people know me in terms of my work around not only anti-racism, but also Afrocentric schooling. Right? Uh, but for me, when I talk about inclusive schooling, I'm not presenting it as a binary. In fact, I can understand why some people would even say, look, can we, why don't we talk about creating our own institutions? And I understand the spirit, I understand the, the, the rationale, and I understand the, the, the reason behind it, uh, the frustration, but I don't want to present it as a binary. It's not like either or, right? I think we need to have those independent spaces, uh, given what has happened to our learners, given what has happened to our communities and our young uh, uh, learners in the school system. But at the same time, we need also need to talk about how we make our current schools inclusive. So it becomes end with, not either or. Um, there are moments when I would say, look, we need to talk about why don't we create our own spaces, right? Come up with a question we ask, and I know uh, someone like Tom would ask the question, um, can, can we decolonize uh, the, the current school system? Uh, I think we can work with possibilities, right? And so it cannot be either or. So I want to map the terrain in terms of what I want to, uh, I, th I think I want to talk a bit about where I'm coming from, then also share uh, my insights into some of the concepts. And then I will take a brief look at the Nova Scotia inclusive policy, which I think there are some strengths that we can work with on that. And then come out with what I call the domains, build on the domains of inclusive schooling, which myself and some of my students very, very early in the 1980s, we developed and we reckon it to the present. And then end with some practical strategies for educators who are working in the, in the school system. So this is where I want to take the conversation. Hopefully we can engage in a dialogue at the end of it in terms of that. So to start with where I'm coming from, right? Uh, and I, I see this as a way of to talk about the political and intellectual subject location for me. I think one of the things is sometimes this, what I call the rhetoric and the national imaginings and imaginaries of inclusion, we talk about it, right? Social cohesion or good citizenship, which mostly is good capitalist citizenship. 
but at the same time, there's institutional avoidance. Right? And, and there's this white benevolence. And I talk about the white benevolence in terms of this idea. We want to do something for. So we are doing something for African Nova Scotians. We are doing something for Maymark students. Rather than talk about it in terms of we are doing something with and not for somebody, but for ourselves. Right. And, and I think we need to trouble this. And I think to me, this is something that has always guided me in terms of this, this idea of the institutional avoidance and, and, and the white benevolence around that. And, and I'll come back to that later. Related to that in terms of also where I'm coming from is what, what is, and I think many of us will share this, right? There's this sense of the performance, the performativity of inclusive education and equity work. Uh, it becomes celebratory, we celebrate it, right? Uh, rather than ask the tough questions. Um, I think one of the things we saw from with Black Lives Matter, right, following the, the death of George Floyd, we saw all these solidarity statements that was coming from every angle, like it was a race to issue a solidarity statement. And you ask yourself, where have you all been all this time? Right? And then we also see it now currently in the discourses around EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, which is a very liberal social justice work under that. So, there's not the politics of naming. So naming race, naming anti-black racism, anti-blackness, right? So that refuses uh, to name issues. Uh, and, and, that, and that becomes very, very troubling. Uh, and, and, that, and that we see this social justice work more as, for example, how do we talk about inclusion rather than talk about how do we create new structures that allow for liberation, right? So social justice should focus on questions of liberation, structures for, 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 for liberation. And I want to bring that perspective to how we talk about inclusive education, how we decolonize that. Uh, also, I think the, the, what I call the silence on particular identities and how these identities connect to schooling and education. Um, you see the resistance with, to BLM, Black Lives Matter. You hear it when people will talk about where all lives matter. Well, Black Lives Matter, no less, no more. And there's a reason why people say that. Also, when we look at it in terms of indigenous identities, how do we take that seriously in terms of schooling and what it means to talk about questions of education? And that's where I'm coming from in terms of that. I'm also coming at it in terms of the need or what I call the agency for pedagogies of subversion, where we teach ourselves and particularly our young learners who in our schools happen mostly to be white, right? To understand their Euro ancestry privilege that privilege, because there's a whole denial around white privilege, right? How many times do we hear people talk about what are you talking about white privilege? I see when we talk about white privilege, we do not presume or we do not assume that whites also can face hardships. Of course, whites can face hardships along the lines of class, gender, sexuality, disability. But there are hardships when we relate it to the way black people face hardships on the basis of their skin color, it's not the same. And this is what I mean by that, that white identity and what it means to be privileged by it. Right? And this means also to me in terms of coming to this to understand some of the new and current phases of racism. Right? So the connections of anti-black racism and anti-blackness, settler colonialism, anti-indigenous racism, anti-Muslim racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and what I call anti-different racisms. And some of the, they mark very particular for different bodies, right? So for example, for black bodies, we see it in terms of issues around police cutting and racial profiling of, of bodies and populations, or what Wilson and Co. talks about in terms of that hypervigilance of our perceived black fiscal formidability. Right? And of course, we can look at it also in terms of our workplaces, whether it's our schools, whether it's in terms of the homes, or we, in terms of our employment settings, in terms of our housing, the discriminations and the racism that take place in, in, that, in that context. Also, I think recently, I think we can't talk about where one is coming from without looking at the COVID and its impact, right? We tend to talk a lot about COVID's impact in terms of health, and we should rightly talk about it in terms of the disparities in health, also in terms of questions of the effects on the economy, right? The, the, the whole question of the racialization of poverty and how that has been intensified. But we also have to look at it in terms of the impact on education and what it means, for example, for us to rethink the climate, the culture, the environment 
the demographic imperatives and the social organizational life of schooling. And this calls for questions of reprioritization. What does it mean to reprioritize in the climate of COVID? But in doing this work, and in doing this anti-racist work, in doing this inclusive education work, in doing this decolonial and anti-colonial work, I think we have to recognize that there can be no gatekeepers. We can't have gatekeepers in this work, whether it's race, inclusion, or equity work. We have to recognize the history of prior efforts or prior work. So I think in the West Coast, for example, we cannot talk about black education without going back to the BLAC report, the Black Learning Advisory Committee report that long time ago people like offshore and others put out, right? But also recognize our different learning stages, right? We don't know it all. So we have to recognize the limits of our knowing and how we bring humility to our work. And part of that bringing humility to our work is sometimes also to recognize that simply having a majoritized racial body doesn't mean that we necessarily get it right. It's part of the humility of our knowing. But at the end of the day, it's something that I always say, right? That any community is as good as we collectively work to make it. If we want a community, a community, we work to create it. Nobody hands you a community, you work to create it. So when somebody says nobody knows what a community means anymore, well, we have to create it. We work to create communities. So how do we create communities in our school system? How do we create communities in our learning spaces, in our workplaces? That's all part of the decolonial project that we need to talk about in this, in this context. So in this presentation, uh, in this, this discussion, I want to have uh, four discursive uh, stances or take four discursive stances. First of all, I think the, the term decolonization should be seen as political and intellectual act, and it begins by asking new questions. So what new questions are we prepared to ask? To me, it's very, very important. But also to recognize, secondly, that the anti-colonial is in, intimately connected to decolonization. And by extension, decolonization cannot happen solely through Western science scholarship and dominant practices. You ask me why? Because Western science scholarship and dominant practices have been part of the problem. So you cannot decolonize by still simply inserting yourself in dominant practices and Western science scholarship. And this leads then to the third discursive stance, which is to recognize that there's a particular place for indigenous epistemologies. Epistemologies that speak about issues about relations, how we build relations. So decolonization becomes relations relations building, how do we build communities? How do we talk about responsibilities? And how do we also address questions of accountability? And I think what the indigenous epistemology allows us is that it allows us not only to challenge, but also to replace and reimagine counter visions or alternatives to colonial, colonial thinking and conventional ways of schooling and education. And the four discussive standards will come out I think, in terms of the way I when it comes to engage questions of decolonial education, is that power of the sanctity of work, sanctity of activity. What is the sanctity of teaching? The sanctity of activity, such as teaching, learning, the administration of education, and the power of creating what indigenous scholars have talked about, which is that sacred learning spaces or sacred landscapes where that we get a sense that there's somebody watching over what you do. We are in the community, we have a responsibility to each other. And there's a, there's a sanctity to that space. There's a sacredness to activity that we wanna do. And I call that in one of my papers, that trialectic space, the space where there's that fusion between the body, mind, soul, and spirit, and engaging that in our work so that we don't separate the body from the mind nor separate from the soul and the spirit, but you have that nexus and begin to work with it in terms of that trialectic space. And others like Cynthia Dillard also talks about this in terms of her work around um, fem and dark in the epistemologies. So asking questions. One of the questions to be, to be asked, for example, is how can we provide anti-colonial inclusive education to assist young the West Coast African and make mark learners to develop a sense of identity, self and collective agency, resistance and empowerment. 
how do we revision school and education in ways that espouse at the center values such as social justice, equity, accountability, resistance, and anti-colonial responsibility? How do we actualize an inclusive educational policy on the ground so that the policy doesn't exist on the book on the shelf, but it's actually concretized on the ground and it's being implemented in a way that makes sense to our learners, to our educators, to our administrators, and to our communities. What is actionable? And this question of what is actionable is very, very important because when we look at it critically, right, our institutions have a way, when I talk about institutions, I'm talking about our school system, whether it's the schools, the colleges, the universities, right? They have a way to use black and indigenous bodies and our ideas as representation and sometimes even as ammunition to construct a project of redemption without reparations. So they use it, they use, they use ideas, they use our pictures, right? Or we are inclusive and you have a few uh, black indigenous faces to show that they are very inclusive, right? And that becomes a project of redemption without reparations. So you see it in the visuals, you see it in official statements, the throwing of names, image, the quotes, and this become validation stamp. As one of my students, Mary Carmen, always talks to me about it, where it becomes a validation stamp. Also, how do we uncover racial spatial imagery, imaginary, or spatial imaginary, which is racially marked on schooling sites? I'm talking here, for example, police presence, gentrification, black and white visual representations on physical walls, notice boards, buildings, and how various posters and visual materials can reinscribe whiteness and that optical illusion that white legitimate knowledge is what we need to produce or what is what is legitimate. So it's an optical illusion. And that optical illusion is feathered through a visual landscape of our institutions. So moving along to some key concepts, I think it's very important to know where one is coming from when certain concepts are used. I think we hear this term around in terms of inclusion. I think to me, inclusion should be breaking away from the past and the current order and beginning anew. That's what it should be. And that is because why do you hope to accomplish change by adding to what already exists? When that which already exists is the source of the problem in the first place. So this idea of beginning anew is very, very important if you want to talk about inclusion. Because this idea of add and stir, you only reproduce the status quo. But also to talk about inclusion as something which is action oriented and it ensures the centrality of learners in ways that affirm their married and competing identities. We talk, for example, about African black bodies, African West Christians. These are not homogeneous groups. They are demarcated by questions of gender, class, sexuality, ability, and disability. So there are this married identity. Sometimes they are competing identities. And I'll leave the experiences that we take them up as part of the project of inclusion and how we present education as holistic learning, where there's that whole embodied learner who is able to act for meaningful change. Long time ago, I talked about sometimes you can have bodies being physically present in the classroom, but they are absent in mind and soul. That is not holistic learning. You see them physically, but spiritually, they are somewhere else. Emotionally, they are somewhere else. If you want to engage holistic learning as part of inclusive education, then we have to engage these questions of identity, culture, history, the body-mind-soul interface that allows us to talk about the wholeness of the learning body and the learning space. We should also see this approach of inclusion as dealing with the intensities of difference that I talked about. For example, how race would intersect with class, gender, sexuality, Two spirit LGBTQ plus, disability, language, and religion. 
And when we do this, also to recognize that the inclusion I'm talking about is in many ways a radical inclusion, which is challenging the depoliticization of difference. Sometimes we talk about difference in a very depoliticized way. And we challenge that. And the way we see it in that depoliticization of difference is these questions around what Lewin a long time ago talked about in terms of the, that standardization recipes. And then where Hooks also rephrases by saying, it's a form of sameness which has become a provocation because that sameness terrorizes. That sameness refuses to acknowledge the pointed differences that exist. So it becomes a sameness which is very, very provocative because it's very, very terrorizing. But also inclusion that addresses questions of power, transparency, accountability, and issues of schooling. Example with colonial hierarchies, the merit badges, who is smart, who is dumb, who is A, who is B, C plus, who is entitled to what? The entitlements, the false sense of entitlements that somebody or some learners will have, that they think the whole world is about them, that they go into the school and they are taught as if the whole world is about them. And also addressing what earlier on my point about the specialization of preparations. And by that, I mean, on matching the geography of exclusions, the historical obligations to African Nova Scotia and make more learners that surpass, quote, the written text, which in most cases tend to be performance. So all the nice ways we have it, it becomes a performance. But also, I think this way of talking about inclusion, I want us to talk about it in that sense, which presents the Afrocentric schooling and also, for example, the band who created Make More Kinamatnewe Independent Schooling as models of anti colonial, decolonial inclusion. It comes back to my point. So I'm saying, yes, we can have this independent size. But they give us lessons for what it means to talk about inclusion. So it doesn't become either or, that we can have them and we learn from them and learn from the lessons in the way we want to pursue educational change in mainstream schools or even in other independent sites. Curriculum. We all hear the term curriculum, right? We know it. But I think it's very important for us to see the curriculum as beyond the text and the instructional materials, beyond the pedagogies, and also as something which is beyond the formal and informal written rules and the regulations, as many people have talked about it. But I want us to see beyond that, to see it in terms of what a long time ago we talked about it as a deep curriculum, which is it embraces the culture. So how do we see anti-blackness? as having part, been part of a schooling curriculum and to disrupt that. So the culture, the climate, the environment, the social organizational life of schools, the deep curriculum. But also not to see the curriculum like a straight jacket. As people like Michael Apple and Henry Giroux, right, a long time ago talked about it, to see it as a path to follow. That yes, we are presented with the curriculum, but we have a leeway to address this issue. So it becomes a course of action to take and to trouble the way it's presented as a particular ordering of society. They rather see it as a method of rewriting, restoring what it means to educate. And then to recognize that when we talk about the curriculum itself, it's power saturated. Who constructs the curriculum? What does the curriculum talk about? Whose experiences? Whose knowledge is? The curriculum is not apolitical. It's not innocent. And therefore, it must and it needs to be a decolonizing act to engage a decolonial curriculum or to engage a curriculum as a decolonial act. 
Then the concept of indigenization, and I, many people have written about this. But I think to me, there are certain things that I think are very important to bring it into this conversation, which is to see it as an approach to teaching and learning land as more than a fiscal space, as more than a fiscal space. The land becomes a site of knowing. It's inclusive of the metaphors of seas, waters, earth, sky, rivers, and how it allows us, as Nano Simpson and others talk about, to reclaim our social, psychic, cultural, and spiritual memories as living forces we learn from. So in Toronto, for example, I always give this, this example to my students when we talk about land, right? Uh, land exists in memories, in psychic memories. Land is not just a physical space. This is why I talk about theorizing Africa beyond its physical boundaries. There's Africa here, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. There's a reason why some African mothers in Toronto will go to Lake Shore, to the ocean, and pour libation into the ocean. That is because they know that their ancestors who were thrown overboard to the Middle Passage might have flown and will be resting at Lake Shore. Because when you throw something into the ocean, it flows. Nobody knows where it rests, finally. So as far as we know, some of these bodies will be at Lake Shore. And that's why they go there, because they have a spiritual connection to that space, the sea, the ocean. And that is theorizing the land as more than physical. It's spiritual, psychological, and emotional. But also, in terms of indigenization, to see the land as about power, the land as a quest for life. And it's also a process in terms of the indigenization, to see it as a process of sociopolitical, historical consciousness, coming to a consciousness about one's ancestry, one's identity, one's culture, one's history, that process of indigenization. When you bring it to education, to see this indigenization as a cultural, political, and spiritual educational agenda that stresses certain ontologies. For example, ontologies about relations and relationality. It's not a possession. You don't possess it. It's relations about relations. It's also ontologies about identity, culture, politics, and the rootedness in place and history. One of the greatest dangers is to have a learner who is de-rooted, a learner who is not rooted, whether in space, on land, or in history. That can be one of the greatest damages that can happen to a learner who is de-rooted. And part of that rootedness in space and place, when you bring it to the process of indigenization, is to begin to know about the past, the present, and the future as relational. So when I talk about the past, the present, and future as relational, you reclaim the past, you reflect on the present, and you project onto the future. That is the relational. So you reclaim the past, reflect on the present, and project onto the future. That is a relational. And it becomes a pedagogical stance. And this past, present, and future is something which is continually lived. And it gives us possibilities of new futures, as even these futures unfold even in the present. We don't have to wait for it. It unfolds in the present. Indigenization also is to see it when it brought to education as an approach and a process of returning to the source, as Amika Cabra, the anti-colonial uh, uh, activists talked about a return to the source. In the Ghanaian lexicon, you talk about Sankofa, that going back and fetch the Forgotten Valley for its educational and development purposes. And indigenous scholars like Alfred and Contassel talk about this also, that indigenization should also work with this idea that colonialism and slavery are not our only reference point. Our, our story does not begin with enslavement. 1492 is not the advent of human history. There was a world before 1492. So colonialism 
and slavery are not our only reference point. And that's a powerful thing to work with in decolonization. Then the big word, decolonization. To me, I want to talk about decolonization in terms of that discursive rationality between indigeneity, colonialism, and decolonization. It, it cannot be understood on its own. You have to look at it in terms of that discursive relationality of indigeneity, colonialism, decolonization. And to see decolonization as a subversive approach, not a superficial add on. It has to be, it's about breaking down colonial structures not a superficial add-on. It requires actions to dismantle and rebuild as Taiki, Behishua, and Wilson talk about and Pebe talk about it. So this power of dismantling and rebuilding. But as I said earlier on, that decolonization is about building relationships in schooling within communities on lands and beyond. And people like Yves Chak and Young, Patrick Wolf, and let's talk about this relationships the land, communities, and beyond. Also developing a critical consciousness of oneself as an educator, a learner who plays history, identity, culture, and memory. And this is very important. Decolonization cannot be about mainstreaming. Decolonization cannot be about a mainstreaming practice. In other words, a decolonial project cannot seek legitimation and validation from the dominant. If it does, then it's not decolonial. If it does, then it's not decolonial. And Latin American scholars also talk about decolonization in terms of that word, beyond reveal, with goodness talks about, which is living well. So decolonization as living well in schooling, where schooling itself becomes a source of life, meaning and power. That people go to school to get life. They don't go to school to get their dreams quashed. Where schooling becomes a source of life. And when schooling does not provide that, then there's something seriously wrong with the education. Decolonization also calls for rematriation of land. Where the, the question of the maternal relations to the land and the sentence of the land, the rematriation of that land, the maternal, the source of life, the source of energy, the source of livelihood. And also addressing the violence of removing black and indigenous bodies from lands. And over scripture, I don't need to remind people there's Big, big example, if you talk about, for example, the removal of black indigenous bodies from land. There's the one we all talk about, Africa view, for example, but the violence of that, right? But it's also, decolonization is also about relinquishing settler futurities. Settler futurities, because the settler has a project of futurity that, for the most part, For the most part, makes the marginalized, the indigenous, and the black body irrelevant. They're only useful if we serve a project. And so we need to relinquish settler for charities that are constructed that way. And part of that is through what some people now will talk about in terms of that land back movements and what it means who being able to determine their own features, resisting the designing of features for them, and being able to articulate and achieve their own self-determination. It also means resisting ways settler colonialism domesticates indigenous or Aboriginal peoples as racialized minorities rather than as colonized nations and domesticated through this process of racial capitalism. So indigenous Aboriginal groups become, or they are presented as racialized minorities rather than see them as colonized nations. 
And lastly, for decolonization, that we are talking beyond discourse, theory, and process to practice. Decolonization is about asking questions, but it's also about doing. The practice become very, very important in that. And when I bring it to my own work in Afrocentric paradigm and Af African schooling, I see decolonizing education as something which is not just about de-Westernizing, as Minuki Asante talks about, but rather a total reassertion of Africa, African Nova Scotian, Black, Mi'kmaq, and other racialized communities at the center of knowledge discovery, interrogation, validation, and dissemination, unquote. And the last of the concepts, if you talk about decolonization, anti-colonialism, and anti-blackness, and understand that as part of this decolonial inclusive curriculum, there's a specificity to anti-black racism and anti-blackness. They are rooted in slavery, colonialism, and the creation of the racial hierarchy where blacks and Africans are at the bottom. And it has implications for how we come to understand black humanhood or the lack thereof. Also, settler colonialism and the way it domesticates black struggles within an anti-racist rather than an anti-colonial framework. There's a need to subvert the containment of anti-blackness within a domesticated anti-racist framework rather than a settler state framework. You know, we there are many, many things now people will call anti-racist. And when you look at it, it's a domesticated anti-racist been domesticated by the state. And this is why when we talk about anti-blackness, we have to see the way the state contains it within the domesticated anti-racist framework rather than the settler state itself. It demands a critique of domesticated and recognized anti-racism that fails to challenge the settler state and the ways black liberating bodies have been used to build the settler nation. As Tiffany Keen and recently Robin Maynard also writes about. But I think to me in this dialectic that I'm talking about in terms of the anti-blackness decolonization thing, I think it's also very important to be working with what I've called a black white paradigm not a black-white binary, a black-white paradigm to work with it. And this paradigm becomes a lens for reading society. How a closer proximity to whiteness is rewarded globally. And conversely, a closer proximity to blackness is punished globally. We need to look at it everywhere. So rather than people tell us, to forget about the black and white, I think we should be working with a black-white paradigm not a binary, a black white paradigm. It's so powerful to understand, to read society through this lens and to recognize that the black white paradigm is not a negation of the colonial impact on indigenous or Aboriginal peoples. We are not negating that. It's neither a hierarchy of oppressions. Some people want to see that's a hierarchy. No, it's not a hierarchy of oppression. But what it also does is that it complicates the indigenous settler binary. It complicates it. It complicates it. For example, Blacks do not fit neatly into that binary. It complicates it. So let me move with, um, as I said in, in, in the beginning, that um, to work with some documents. And I've seen the, the, the Nova Scotia Education Policy. There's so many sense on this document. I'm just highlighting a couple of things. But I also read the education, inclusive education, that call, the call to value black students' lives so they can fulfill their promise and potential. As I said, this distance all flow from some of the pioneering works of people with the 
example, the Black Learning Advisory Committee. And, and, uh, let me, uh, for example, in looking at it, around the strategies for effecting systemic change, uh, it's very, very clear that the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development held these consultations with African education staff, community stakeholders, parents, and families. That consultation is very, very important. And I think the point I want to stress here is that anytime you have the consultations, the importance of youth in, in this extensive consultation process is always going to be key. The youth. How we bring the youth and center them in the consultation process is going to be key. The focus, also looking at the document, African West Scotian and make more students. Primary to grade 12 students, employees of New and Public Education. Now, two things I want to mention here is the importance of the intestacies of subject identities I talked about. That even within these categories, within the African West Scotian and the make more students, the power of intestacies, intersectionalities. When we look at students, that intersectionality is also very, very important. But also that we cannot have this conversation simply to, with the public education system. We also have to look at the private educational systems as well. The private educational systems. Now, some important directives that I noticed also is the teaching support teams and the learning support teams. And these are so important if we address the challenge of bringing African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq elders into both directives. Learning from these elders and working with the land, the environment, and the earthly teachings, which is part of that indigenous philosophies, which is one of the key pillars of a decolonial or decolonized inclusive strategy. So working with this African Nova Scotian elders, the Mimok elders, learning from these elders, working with the teachings of the land, environment, and the earthly teachings. There are important select roles and responsibilities. For example, the document talks about building meaningful relationship with students parents, families, and other members of school community to collectively support students' well-being and achievement. As part of the student process planning process, every school will, will use evidence, including disaggregated data. The question of disaggregating the data is key to monitor how students, uh, to monitor students and evaluate how students are doing so as to be able to respond appropriately and provide timely support. To recognize that spirituality, I was so happy when I read this. To recognize that spirituality is integral to the wellness, resiliency, and the experience of many Black learners. To use knowledge to affirm students' identities and build linkages to the institutions and organizations that nurture their sense of purpose and well being. To recognize and address white privilege in particular. Provide African West Coast and Black uh, students with access to school counselors and that who operate and are informed by anti-racist scope of practice. Developing a mandatory anti-racism and discrimination leadership mode. Aspiring and current school leadership or school administrators and leaders and hiring more staff such as student support workers and African Resolution facilitators. I don't think anybody will have quarrel with this. The point is the rhetoric would have to match the action, the ways, how we follow through so that it's not just something which is simply on paper. Highlighting and underscoring the significance of Afrocentric education and practice. Well, it's one thing to say we want to highlight and underscore its importance, but how are we making to ensure that there's a possibility of having that Afrocentric or Afrocentric education in schools 
in place? And how do we implement an inclusive educational policy? I think one of the things that's so important also in when I look to the terms of the roles and responsibilities, paying attention to questions of environment and climate education, the accountability measures, setting goals and enforcing the timelines. And I come to this because one of the things one times when we see is that sometimes we can have nice policies. They have nice policies, but the implementation is one thing. Nobody is held accountable for not implementing it. So we can pull it out of the shelf, dust it up, nice, nice, and show it. But how we implement it? And how do we ensure that we monitor the impact that it has? So general reflections on inclusive policy documents. We need that incentive consultation, communication, and buy-in with internal and external bodies and partners, especially the underserved communities. Black, Mi'kmaq communities have to buy in whatever we do with these policies. It has to be a systemic institutional approach with an explicit anti-colonial commitment to acknowledge the legacies of racism, oppressions, which are beyond institutional commitments, which I spoke to you about. You see, one of these institutional commitments, uh, the express institutional commitments I'm talking about is where, uh, you know, so we have a school, this school would say, oh, um, racism has no place in our institution. Well, let's talk more about how racism manifests itself within our institution, rather than just simply say racism has no place. Let's talk about how it manifests itself because then it makes, it holds us accountable. Also a comprehensive anti-racist, anti-colonial training for educators and school administrators. And this is where, for example, the faculties of education become very, very key, right? The faculties of education, because this is where we are producing the teachers. This is where the teachers are coming from. Identifying priority areas for immediate attention and redress. And also offering sustained institutional funding and commitment to follow through policy goals and recommendations. Sometimes we have policies in place, but there's no funding to support our aspirations. And when that happens, we must as well not have the document. When there's no commitment, there must be a commitment, a funding commitment. Serious equity work, serious anti-colonial inclusive work. It's about money, it's about funding. I want to revisit now the conceptual domains that we talked about earlier in our work uh, for inclusive decolonial curriculum. And I'm talking here about this work, about the work that I did with some of my students long before, I mean, people like Jasmine Zinn, uh, James Wilson, um, and that was documented in that book, Inclusive Schooling, a teacher companion for me in the margins. And recently in the piece with me and uh, Kemp, uh, when we are talking about Afrocentric education, we, we, we've also added to that, right? So I just want to revisit that. So and talk a bit about the, what I call the eight conceptual domains for inclusive decolonial curriculum. The first is representation, the question of representation. Visual representation is very, very important. So the question of the visual culture, the landscape and the spirituality of schools. Also knowledge representation is very, very important. Knowledge, knowledge from the very backgrounds because it's about power and it's also about resistance. And of course, the physical representation. So don't tell us we can give you African history, but we can't give you African Nova Scotian teachers. No, African Nova Scotian teachers is about representation the physical representation, which is so much important. It's key. Language, the second domain, which is where we promote and enhance local indigenous or first language of learners. Because language becomes a mode of transmission of culture, history, identity, 
and ancestral knowledge. For, for those of us who grew up in cultures where to speak your indigenous language was even punished in the colonial school system, you can see how language is very important because it's about identity, it's about culture, it's about history. So to promote languages as indigenous languages as resistance and liberation, because it allows learners to use their local vernacular or local cultural indigenous minority languages to question and resist that language that minimizes, denigrates, and penalizes. The third domain is that family school interface. So linking the school, the home, and the off-school culture to create spaces for co-creation of knowledge with families and community involvement. Disrupting that conventional schooling practice where you merely insert parents and local communities into already existing hierarchical structures of schooling. They are only needed when it's big and sale. To see parents and community elders as knowledge producers, educators and change agents, they, there's a correlational status with the communities in the education of our children because they are seen as knowledge producers. They are also change agents. They are valued, respected, and appreciated. Cooperative education, the fourth. Institutional and pedagogical practices that ensure schools as community hubs, schooling as community or a community of learners. Collective learning and learner responsibilities that we define success broadly, that success is about cooperation, is cooperative. It includes academic and social success. It sees success as beyond the individual accomplishment and achievement and present success as inclusive of community contributions. So the success I'm talking about is to subvert even the whole idea of say the MVP, the most valuable player. Well, without the other players, you will not have a most valuable player. The other players made that most valuable player. To see that success as collective. Then the equity and values education the curricular and social practices that foreground social difference and power, questions of race, class, gender, sexuality, the two spirit LGBTQ plus, not as spoke about. Promoting values that enhance spiritual, emotional, psychological, and character development of the learner. So when we talk about character development, it's not just simply hard work. To me, character development of the learner is also about a learner who is in tune with questions of equity and social justice. Presenting teaching and learning as emotionally felt experience that emphasize the affective and the psychomotor domains of the learner. Not just the cognitive competencies, but to begin to appreciate questions of love, peace, justice, relations, and responsibility. The sixth domain is that indigenous cultural knowledge. So local cultural resource knowledge through the multicentric knowing, the idea of multicentricity, which subverts the idea of only a dominant center. When we have multiple centers, it centers the dominant center. It decenters the dominant center. Intergenerational teachings as indigenous educational philosophies, such as sharing, reciprocity, relations, healing, community building, and also to work with empirical and revealed knowledges that are based on everyday observations on people's environments, the homes and the communities, the power of that knowledge, that this is about their everyday life and validating that knowledge and how it makes sense. And sometimes some of these knowledge can even be acquired through intuition, revelations and dreams and visions. Spirituality and learning, the seventh domain. This is upholding the presence, the spiritual presence of bodies in schools and schooling. So where learners are seen as spiritual beings, 
they are spiritually informed thought and practice. The right spiritually informed thought and practice. Understanding learners relationship to a creator, however they call the creator, the land, mother earth, conceptions of the self, personhood, and connections to inner and outer environment. Learning relationships that are established through understanding all elements of the universe as interconnected. The society, culture, and nature are connected. The body, the mind, soul, and spirit that I talked about as connected. And you see spirituality as about relationship centering and relationship building as Maya and Delia have all talked about. Relationship centering and relationship building. And to use this spirituality as a motivator for academic performance and educational success. Where spirituality becomes the source of social justice and racial equity activism. And to evoke this spirituality to heal that damage to bodies, the emotional, the mental wounding. The last domain, the learning for environment and climate, climate justice. So critical understandings of the land, the environment, a focus on the forces and policies of climate crisis, aggravation and mitigation and that teaching to link colonialism with capitalism and environmental destruction. And to examine solutions and struggles of environmental sustainability for multiple global conflicts. In this last session, I want to talk about um, the philosophy of practice, the philosophy of teaching practice. And just highlight some things that could, I want educators, learners, for us to think about. One is something I've talked about. One is the question of representation, the fiscal knowledge, staffing, promotion of African and West Christian, Black, Mi'kmaq, and other racialized communities, cultural knowledge in the school current as broadly defined. Also, the idea of teaching power, mapping and translating power in schooling, breaking down the colonial hierarchies, the buried badges, the ideas, the beliefs, the stereotypes, and the prejudices that we that produce particular historical and intellectual narratives. Mandating race and anti-black racism causes in the school curriculum, even beyond K-12. So you're mandating these courses even in the primary K-12 and beyond. Physical teaching a need to review history books and history lessons, placing emphasis on analysis of historical content and critical thinking. The use of critical historical texts that debunk Greek Roman whiteness assertions. I would like to see, for example, us teach what a demise monster instead of using the to kill a monkey bird. I would rather see us teach that Walter demise monster rather than to kill a monkey bird. Having resources, whether literature, historical novel, drama, that allows students to see themselves in their own representations. Teaching omissions and hidden histories that speak to social injustices, violence, and local resistance. Teaching colonization and enslavement to uncover white colonial privilege, racialized resistances, teaching about anti-blackness through celebrations, histories of resistance, and teaching about a, a heinous black community races such as Atwood Bill. Teaching African West Scotian, black, Mi'kmaq, and other racialized people's histories across all grades. And it's also across subjects, not just social science or social studies curriculum. Sometimes you hear people talk about, oh, all these things only happen with social science. No, all the sciences, the physical, the natural, and so forth, the mathematics, the STEM, and integrating African indigenous, Asian history, and so forth, year round in the curriculum. 
also to examine the discipline of our learners. When we look at current disciplinary measures, the suspension and expulsion rates, and the experiences that these students go through and to develop alternatives, working with local communities to develop alternatives. Approaches that are consistent with questions of collaboration between families, local communities, students, educators, and administrators. The big area, special education streaming. How certain bodies are streamed in this special education angles. Sometimes our kids don't get to be kids. Even as, as early as senior kindergarten, we teach our kids like they are adults. That adultification of the learner that they don't get to be kids. And to develop or to identify barriers and develop strategies to move these seven processes that impede on students' success and lead to their overrepresentation in these programs. Building community and caregiver relations with educators that tap into African, Nova Scotian, Black, Mi'kmaq, and other racialized learners' cultural knowledge within communities. So elders to support the well-being of students, the academic achievement of students, promoting the use of storytelling, having a local poet do that spoken word with students who express themselves orally. I think the goal of all this is to ensure that the learner, right, benefits from the wealth of knowledge that exists in their communities. So we, to ensure that African, the West Coastian, Black and Memo, elders, parents, students see themselves reflected and feel their voices heard within curriculum programming, thereby cultivating a greater sense of belonging in schooling and communities. Promoting indigenous languages, addressing the pathways and transitions, supporting African and West Coastian students and learners as a transition to high school, to college, to university, to academic pathways, to secondary opportunities and learning, supporting African and West Coastian Black, Mi'kmaq and other racialized youth leadership development, the whole question of leadership development. That will also support student activism. There's so much of punishing of resistance rather than rewarding resistance. So we need to reward social justice activism that allows us to change our environment, to change our worlds and promote that culture of protest movements among our learners as we build communities. And to develop that self collective healing processes in schools that shed our distorted patterns and we begin to embark on personal and collective on learning and healing journeys. So that we have a space for our learners to gather to support and advocate for themselves. In this final session, I want to talk about implementing the colonial curriculum, some practical institutional guidelines. And I'm focused on just briefly five areas. So we start with the institutional policy implementation. And this is about implementation. You can have the policy, but how do you implement the policy? So you develop institutional, such as the regional centers of education, implementation, implementation strategies for diversification of decolonial curriculum with focused attention to African, Nova Scotian, Black, Mi'kmaq, and other racialized learners. There's a focused attention. So our implementation strategies will have that focused attention on these learners. Setting clear guidelines, timelines, academic expectations, measures of accountability, and meeting the demands of these communities. That is an institutional framework to support strategies for inclusive teachings 
identification of school staff mandates meeting demands of underserved communities. The development of an equity standard of some kind to assess the effectiveness and success of policy implementation across all courses. You can implement the policy, but you also have to have a way to assess its effectiveness. And this is where, for example, the regional councils of education come in, in terms of enhancement of social and academic performance of African Western Black, female, and other racialized learners. Paying attention to governance issues, including design and implementation strategies, which have to do with the scope and organizational life or stretches of schools and departments. The important goal here is addressing the question of accountability, because sometimes there's too much of that performance. And as Sarah Ahmed talks about, that non-performative speech acts can equally be dangerous of our institutions. That practice of policy existing only in name or on the books. Specific equity initiatives. Regional centers of education to revisit their objectives, mandate policies and practices to consider internal exclusionary barriers to African, West Scotian, Black, and other racialized learners, and what needs to be done to move these systemic barriers. Pursuing annual periodic curriculum review of educational programs. And this will involve even introducing new ones. And this can be carried out by RCEs for their impact on African and West Coast Black, as well as Big Mock and other racialized learners. Incentivizing the development of academic programming initiatives that promote decolonial and anti-colonial teaching and learning methodologies, creating funds to support such initiatives, and a very systemic thinking through of how groups and bodies, organizations such as DBDLI, through for example, this DEVO, can help develop such programming. Community outreach is very, very important. To address the question of education relevance for the communities that we prepared to serve. Educators making connections on grounding themselves within these communities as a form of knowledge generation, teaching, dissemination, and academic responsibility. How can you teach a community you don't know? The same way we talk about you cannot see yourself in what you can't see, right? How can you teach about a community you don't know? So identifying community issues that need redress in joint consultative processes. We can also talk about this without looking at pedagogies and methodologies of teaching. So this diversifying the curriculum to development of new modalities of teaching and learning, the infusion of multiple teaching methodologies, pedagogies, and academic courses. The application of African indigenous initiatives already in place to support critical understandings of Africa, blackness, indigenities, and global histories. For example, the complex black presence in Canada, indigenous black presence on Mi'kmaq lands, the Maroons and the British Empire loyalists, the descendants of underground railroad, the black pioneers, and the post 1961 black immigration. This all reveals the complex black presence of this land. And we need to have pedagogies in place that are able to teach. And we have historians that write about these things. Teaching methodologies that work with non traditional sources, such as the voices of African and West Christian Black, Mi'kmaq, and other indigenous 
or Aboriginal elders. In one of our recent books, um, um, Central African Proverbs, we show how you can work with elders to teach Proverbs. So a consideration of a more dialogical curriculum co-creation in schools and classroom teaching involving African and West Coastian, Black, Mi'kmo, and other racialized students in their communities. So that dialogic curriculum creation, co-creation, that sense where they feel that they have a stake, that they own it because they have been part of creating it. They own it. Evaluation and assessments. We still need to deal with the rigid Eurocentric evaluation methods and to begin to consider orality as equal medium to the written text. So for example, giving students opportunity to submit assignments orally, not limiting the text to only academic projects, but also to include community-based events such as sites of learning. So students will be given opportunities to attend community events or participate in organizing an event. They have access to other teachers and then write or present reflections on these. These other teachers could be the elders, the community educators, and then they will present and write on this. Encouraging students to present non-traditional papers, whether it's in the art-based multimedia, as other opportunities to be creative and think outside the box. A recognition and honor of multiple ways of knowing and being. Research and infrastructural support. To seek more meaningful research partnerships with multiple sectors and communities and offer related support for non for more transcultural and progressive instructional and teaching partnerships. So to partner with local African, Nova Scotian, Black, Mi'kmo, and other racialized scholars and elders. Even this idea that we have in some of our universities, where we have the elder scholar in residence. Right? So to have African and West Coastian Black people, elder scholar in residence in our schools, not just in universities or colleges, but also in our schools. They just don't come there only to tell the stories, but they are all there, already there as educators. They are scholars in residence in our school, in our schools, colleges. So in conclusion, I want to reiterate this point. That is important that we begin to reframe schooling as community. And we can only do so when we work with African and indigenous ideas and conceptions of relationality, sharing, reciprocity, collective responsibility, and accountability. That in this process, we could well see the school as a place of refuge, as Martin and Hani talks about. But it's a place of refuge to engage in critical learning. But we must be in these spaces, whether we are educators, whether we are learners, or whether we are parents or community educators. We are in this place, but it doesn't make us. So we have a place for us to be in, but not to be made out of it. This is the only way we begin to get into the road of becoming that subversive educator or the learner, what I've called the academic warrior, born from what I run is Gorilla Intellectual, the academic warrior, the warrior who's working to tear down colonial structures. At the end of the day, we have to refuse coloniality. And refusing coloniality would mean that we begin to ask, what schools do we want? And what schools are we willing to fight for? As I said earlier on, there are those who would say, look, we need to create our own schools. And I think there's legitimacy in that. But we can also talk about 
we can look at our mainstream schools and say we are willing to fight to turn them into the schools we want. And when we want to work with this posture of refusing coloniality, we have to insert ourselves in that thinking that another possible is possible. I've always talked about that importance or the important search for a trialectic space. That is a space that makes us human. It heals us. It allows us to meet our responsibilities and our challenges. It is a space where there's the wholeness of the interface between the body, the mind, the soul, and spirit. And finally, for us to see education, whether we look at it in terms of the teaching, learning, or the administration of education, as above everything else, a sanctity of activity. To see it as a sanctity of activity. Thank you, Santi Sana. Nana, mm. I'm going to take a moment and thank you for that. I know that's a lot for everyone, um, depending on where you're coming from to this subject. Um, so again, we're going to take five minutes um, to use a washroom break, um, process. And if you have questions, start getting them into the chat. I've been monitoring it a bit, but I'm going to make sure we stay on time. Um, to get you guys out of here within the next 30 minutes um, as the end time of our event. So some questions have already started to trickle in, um, but if you need to take a moment to it's stretch your legs, yeah. use the washroom, go ahead. Um, we're gonna come back in five um, minutes and start answering some of these questions and starting to have a discussion and unpack everything that we just learned or heard, I should say. Um, Nana, if you're ready, we can. Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to also acknowledge where I'm coming from in, in this conversation that we're about to have as I am coming as someone who is um, of an able body black woman who is from my, my family is connected to Phil and the land in Cherry Brook in East Preston um, and that knowledge of coming here through um, the slave trade. So I'm coming with a little bit of a different experience. Um, I'm not the the expert as Nana is. So some of the questions, I guess, let's start off with, is it possible to decolonize education? Um, as it, the question is, without connecting to the broader land, but land back movements and other treaty obligations. And Nana, you already noted uh, to this, and I don't think you can decolonize without acknowledging where we're sitting on. And the fact that we're sitting on unceded um, territory, which means that this land was not given 
Um, it was not for sale, it was not negotiated, this land was taken, it wasn't vacant. Um, and acknowledging that violence that that comes with and how we've created our society, um, I don't think we possibly can decolonize education without acknowledging that. And I'm seeing head moves, so there's nothing to <laughs> add there. Um, yeah, no, no, I, yeah, no, you, you, you're right. I think, that, I, I mean, it's the whole thing about, um, for example, we, you see, the, the land is not just simply acknowledging it. It's also to know the history, right, behind it, right? And, and, and as you said, right, uh, there's a whole powerful history. And what is the lessons of that history? What is the knowledge of working with that, right? Uh, and I, I think it's very important for us. And, and to me also to see the land not just simply as a physical, as a physical uh, uh, entity, right? In terms mm -hmm. of the psychic, the emotional, and the spiritual, and the connections with that, and what it means then to, 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 to do that. And I think to me, when we talk of say, uh, and, and I'm glad you are, Tanika, you're talking about your, your, your ancestry, right? When, when I look at my ancestors, for example, I, 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 I want to be able to talk about my African indigeneity, right? But I also want to talk about knowing that what does it mean to talk about an African indigenity being on, say, uh, indigenous people's land here, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it should be either or. I think we should be have a way. And that's what I talk about in terms of that cartographies of indigenities in the plural, right? To be able to, to talk about it and the implications of that. Because the land is very, very important in terms of the teachings and the history, right? And, and the affirmation of that it does. Um, and so, the next conversation that we got an earlier piece, um, your thoughts on teacher recruitment and teacher mm -hmm. education program. And so one of the thoughts I think of, and it's always going to be, I shouldn't say always going to be, but it's often comes up is what's the right fit for a teacher and what is the right fit for um, working in private schools or working as an EA and what, how you present yourself. And I know as black females, we're always talking about our hair and what it should look like if we should come natural or not. Should we uh, you noted the black and white paradigm and like trying to look more white so that we could be seen as acceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so coming to that question, um, I know what I've heard and seen that works really well within our schools in Nova Scotia is that some of our African Can Canadian caseworkers that are in the schools that are supporting our students, they look like the students. So they are, they're given a little bit more freedom as what I've heard, um, as they say it to um, express themselves and how they feel without getting, I guess, maybe the some of the other constricts that other teachers feel. Um, but that is one way that they create a space for students to come to them, as well as creating a space for students to see themselves in these positions. Right. But what are your thoughts on connection and like how we recruit our teachers? Because obviously we have teachers that are from our communities, just not in positions that we see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I look, um, I always talk about bodies matter, right? Um, but so does the politics of the body, right? I, I think it's very important for students, learners, to see teachers who look like them, so as to be able to draw the identification, right? But part of that identification is also about the politics of that body, right? Where, for example, it's also very important for, for the, 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 the students to see uh, teachers who are resistant, right? Teachers who are able to, to work to build, but tear down something that is colonial, right? And, 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 mm -hmm. that. and so this is why it's so important, right? And I think, so the question of how we recruit teachers is going to be key, right? Uh, no, I talked earlier on about knowing the communities that we are working with. Mm -hmm. right? I think mm -hmm. that the kids have to know the community they are working with, to be, to be grounded in that community knowledge, to know the issues that affect the community, right? I think it's very, very... But also to be able to work with your students, and you cannot work with your students if your students are not able to identify with you, right? If your students are not able to identify with, you, there's no way the students will be able to work with you. So it becomes a very, very important point that you you also know that uh, at least they, you, 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 as a teacher, you have that responsibility uh, uh, also to make yourself not just simply accessible, but also and, and some knowledge of of where your students are coming from and their their their, their concerns and issues and be able to strike that dialogue and conversations with, with them. Uh, I made a point along that, look, it doesn't mean that simply because you are, say, a racialized or a black or indigenous teacher, you get it all right all the time. No, mm -hmm. it's, it's about also the humility, right? That humility of knowing, right? Because we are all in a journey. Learning is about the journey that we are all in. Our, our students, teachers, 
just as our, our, our peers and other educators also we teach us and we learn from our environments and, and be able to do that. I, I think it comes back to the, also the point that I was making. I think in all of this, right, I, I think uh, teacher education uh, is key, teacher education. So that's where the faculties of education, uh, because that's where they teach. How do we train uh, the teachers within these faculties of education? How are they? Yeah, how do no, you in questions of anti racism, anti black racism, uh, questions of indigeneity, and, and that how they grant them all those knowledge? I think that's also important to note how we teach our teachers because sometimes having just the one or the few black teachers, sometimes they're just looked at to be the experts, as you're saying, and sometimes they're coming from a different journey or different experience, and they don't have all the answers. And I don't think anyone always has all the answers. So I think just not checking off the box, but also looking at how do we bring other others into this perspective and continuing to learn. So one of the questions coming in, I'm going to summarize, it's pretty long. Um, <laughs> but uh, someone noted that they have observed this experience around collective discomfort around disability within the African Nova Scotian community. What are some factors around this and what can we as a community do to address this and to foster this policy collectively? Okay, you've noticed I didn't get the first, the first part. Sorry, um, the individuals noted I have observed and experienced a collective discomfort around disability within the African oh. Nova Scotian community. Hmm. So I, I mean, I, so the, the discomfort, the discomfort in terms of we don't talk about that issue, or is that what? I'm. Um, that's what I'm getting. Um, yeah, beside. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think this is a. See what? Uh, look. You cannot talk about, say, for example, race without looking at how race intersects mm -hmm. with questions of gender, class, ability, disability, and, and that. I think because the full effects of race are compounded by these other interstices. Any of the interstices are compounded by the other uh, identities, right? And I think we should be able to address the, those, 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 those issues, right? We should, we should be able to to address, address those issues. So I don't know about um, the, the extent of the discomfort. I mean, whether it's the, uh, people don't want to talk about it as what, as it's not something worth, uh, I have not encountered that discomfort. I think to me, it's also recognizing the expertise, the different expertise that people have, right? When we engage certain subjects, right? I always make it very, very clear that look, uh, um, as, as somebody who, who, who is cisgender, who is male, right? Uh, sometimes I cast my gaze on the side mm -hmm. from which I feel oppressed, but I never cast my gaze on the side from which I oppress, right? And this is why it's so important for us to see that we need to cast our gaze equally on the side from which we oppress, just as we cast our gaze on the side from which we oppress, right? Or we are oppressed. And this is why I think it's very, very important. So I, I don't think this could be uh, something that you could just say. It's, it's a valid concern that we need to address in our communities, right? Because uh, race intersects with the other even and, and disability and, and that race and disability is something for us to address and talk about in, 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 in terms of our work as educators, community workers. And, and I think that's also a good point um, coming from, again, my experience working as a disability support worker. I think within our communities, um, we've also been, I don't want to say corrupted, but we've bought into the notion that we are strong and that we don't, we are very silly and resilient um, mm -hmm. and that we can overcome things if we work harder. Um, and we don't really talk about some of having a different ability and mm -hmm. seeing that as mm -hmm. a, it's just mm -hmm. a different ability, mm -hmm. but we see it as a, like a, an end game. So I think mm -hmm. having conversations around that and then, you know, that builds into mental health within our communities mm -hmm. and just uh, opening up and seeing it. Um, I think that also helps then to have those conversations where you're now introduced to a new lens so that when mm -hmm. you're at the table discussing these matters of the inclusion policy, you can come back into it to say, you know, we're forgetting this lens. And now mm -hmm. if we look at this through this lens, what are we missing or what it, what can we do to enhance it? Yeah. So one yeah, of the no, things- No, no, just wait, last, one point before you go on. I, I think, yeah, just on this point, I, I, I think I do, I do even sometimes speak about this in my own way. I, I think, I mean, being um, in my department, right? Um, when we hired a colleague, right, who who, who was, I, I mean, a, a very one of Canada's pioneers colleagues on disability, right. I learned a lot, right. There were so many things I was taking for granted, right. 
And I began to see, you know what? Yeah. It's, it, it, so again, it speaks about the humility, but also the, the openness to learn, right? Because sometimes we don't cast our gaze on, 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 the, on the sides, right? On, 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 on that. Sorry. No, uh, I want to bring up the my biggest thing when I see these policies come into play that you've noted to, um, and as someone sitting on case now when we're talk, discussing new policies, I'm always I was come back to and ground myself in and what is the accountability? Because mm -hmm. so often we, mm -hmm. and when we talk about decolonization and we want to try to do anti-racist move work, um, we continue to center whiteness and empathize with it. So when we do talk about these policies and I come back to this to say accountability, but how many times can like say a professor or a teacher or a principal uh, continue to have anti-racism come in? And I'm, I'm gonna bring up um, Prince, uh, Prince Andrew High School just recently down here. The students, I built two weeks ago, I think they, they stepped out of school to in protest for anti-racism. And so when I'm looking at that as someone who's trying to vocalize their, their voice, it comes down to like, why is this still happening in the environment? Mm -hmm. And when you're talking mm -hmm. about the curriculum that you're fostering, um, where's the accountability? Where, yeah. like, how many shots do I give you yeah. before we start taking yeah. things mm -hmm. into account? And I think that's something else that these policies don't include mm -hmm. in that they're mm -hmm. saying, we're gonna do all of this jazz to create this and foster this great environment. But when we, and it just, it's assumed as if everyone's going to absorb it and there's gonna be yeah. no errors and no mistakes. But even if there are mistakes, how do we, continue to address it how many times yeah. um so what are your thoughts on that yeah no no I, no I, I think it's precisely the point that we're making i think one of the things about policy is how do we hold people accountable when, when policies are not being implemented it's one thing to have a policy on the books right but when the very things that the policy talks about it's not being addressed who do you hold accountable right it's something that we need to put it on right that okay yes we have this policy and therefore it's something it's not being addressed, you're going to hold somebody accountable. You're going to hold that. And I think drawing the lines of accountability, right, is going to be very, very important. Because sometimes what you see, right, is, is that uh, um, you also talk about accountability in a way that doesn't look at, address the question of who are we accountable to, right? Who are we accountable? Um, the communities that sustain us, how are we accountable to them, right? Mm -hmm. So the local communities, they, they most they are the self communities, right? How are we accountable to them when, for example, we are not doing what we are expected to do, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to pay attention to that the, the question the, the, the question of accountability because I think um, unless we address that, right, uh, people will see it more like performance, right? They see it more like a performance. They see it like okay, we are, we are just um, we have it nice, it's, it's in the bookshelf in, in that. Right, and we can always point to that. We have we have this policy, we have anti-racist policy, anti-black racism policy, and that. Uh, but who do you hold accountable when, uh, in a school that has an anti-black racism policy, we still have say uh, uh, racist uh, practices playing out in in, 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 in that? Uh, but I also want to talk just on this point because I think we also need to talk about communities, right? How we, we, we and this is how how we create communities in that. Um, um, I think. We need to help sustain each other in the work that we do. And I think it's very important for us to have our communities that are going to be there for each other when we do this work. Because doing this work, right, comes with a cost. Doing okay. this work comes with a cost, right? It's not only the emotional, the spiritual, right? Uh, there are also something which has to do with physical material, right? Anybody who's done this work, I think if you look at scholars who do this work, right? They will tell you all the horror stories, the verbal assaults, the threats, and 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 that they are the the, the, the the charges of being anti-intellectual and, and and that. And I think to me, being able to support each other in this work is, is going to be very, very important in, in that in that sense. Um, one of the questions coming in is that uh, so I'm just highlighting it again. Um, that there's a lot of internalized racism within the black community and mm -hmm. especially within Nova Scotia. And so looking to indigenous communities as this individual's noted, um, there's, it looks like a sense of unity and that our community uh, as a black community, we're lacking. So how to, how to strengthen or foster a community? Um, what are your, I guess, your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, no, first of all, we see when we talk about community, we are, we are not talking about community of sameness. 
we are community of differences. And how do we, how do, our strengths are our differences. We are a strong community because of our differences, right? And that means we also have to look at how we internalize the very oppressions we are critiquing and mm -hmm. revisit it on, on our own, right? And we have to address that, right? We have, we have, we have, we, we have to address, nobody is saying that we should put it under the carpet, right? I think we have to, we have to, we have to address that. My assistance sometimes has been that there's a tendency for some people to focus too much on that intra, right, as an escape route. So we want to talk about uh, the dominance of, of certain oppressions, right, as perpetrated by dominant groups, right, in that. And then there's a counter, right? Well, look at your own community, you, you are each, mm -hmm. each other's throat. And that becomes, a, it's, it's like a politics of deflection, right, from that, right? And, and I think that's and my, go ahead. I think that is a work, um, of settler colonialism and white supremacy when those conversations of looking within your community come out because that's a lot of what happened um when george floyd like the, everything mm -hmm. the protests were coming out were like you know a lot of all lives matter people were like well i'm going to start caring when you start caring with what's happening in your community and it is a deflection piece and i think that is important to understand that that is a deflection and that we can be a community and not be a sameness and that yeah. but we're coming together based on maybe an issue and at this point it could just be education and yeah. being okay with that but also acknowledging that we are coming mm -hmm. from and I think yeah. that's where you talked about not having gatekeepers because of yeah. it, that is also important and I'm going to tie it into um student centered and making sure our students are at these tables and they're at every aspect to having a voice so that they can be amplified mm -hmm. because when we start speaking for them we're not we're going to miss things and yeah. we're going to we're going to fail them yeah. No. Um, so one of a lot of their question, um, it says when you speak of revisiting, revisiting objectives and policies, who might, who must start that process? Um, mm. if you can notify mm. that a little bit. Mm. Good question. Good question. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I think, you see, the the communities always put pressure, right? But it's a question of whether voices are heard. Right, and I think uh, it's very important for the committee to do its work, and I hope, hopefully count on uh, people who are in positions of influence and leadership to be able to take this these voices on and, and, and do that. So when you ask me who should do who should make this take the lead, right? Um, I, all of what I would say is that well, the committee has no choice but to always get has to get his voice on the table, right? It doesn't mean we haven't been. We have. It's whether we are listening to other who talks about us, wanting to speak. It's not to, to say you have been heard, right? In, 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 in that. But I think it's very important that um, those who are in positions of leadership, and that's this is why I talk about the critical allies, the critical friends, right? Critical friends. Um, I think we, in, in the struggle against injustice, we always have to have critical friends, friends that you, you, you would be critical of their practice, but also see that they can also be productive allies in fighting for the change that that we want, right? And 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 and, and doing that. Um, I think this this is the whole thing about how we talk about the politics of change. The politics of change requires that we see how we are each complicit in each other's oppression, but also to also find out about our differential responsibilities in addressing. The problems at hand to bring about change. That doesn't mean that we say everything goes, or we say we are we are all equally oppressed, or we are all oppressors. I think we have to talk about our different layers, our different complexities, right? Even as we hold uh, dominant groups accountable for some of these issues. Earlier on, you raised a question about the the racisms, for example, right? Um, I think one of the things. The, one, the colonial logic, one of the things about the colonial logic is how we internalize our oppressions and revisit it on others. That's part of the colonial logic, right? And, 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 that. and we have to be able to address that within our communities. And, and, that. Um, and so last question um, we're going to get to today. Um, it says that the issue of our true history in Nova Scotia is not taught in schools and the knowledge mm -hmm. of what we were before enslavement is not shared, even out of the school or in black circles. 
how in your view do we navigate these two issues that are interconnected in the present in the mm -hmm. present and history yeah it, it's 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 step, it used to be it used to be people would say oh well we don't have this history we have this history documented we have scholars out there right who have documented our histories right there are the focal person others who are there the desmonds and who have the glories here and who have documented our histories right and i think this very, very important for uh as, look um Ros rosemary sander and others right we, we have to right we have to continue to insist that these things are taught for our young learners in the school system right we have to insist that this is i think people can no longer make this excuse that oh we don't know how to we don't have the literature we don't have that the, the books are out there if you are committed you go out and look for the resources but this is also why it's so important that to me as i talk about the responsibility of educators you have to talk about responsibilities of families and homes i think we also have to, within our own community we have to do our own work we kind of solely rely right mm -hmm. there's a part of me that says why 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 shouldn't we rely no of course i think to me it's so the 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 the, the challenges right i said that we cannot just simply sit down and say no somebody has to do it we have to do it but also continue to put pressure on 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 the school system to uh, to 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 do it right when, earlier on i made a point about being derooted right one of the mm -hmm. damages a learner can do is when they are deleted from their history mm -hmm. and they are not anchored in the history right and i think to be anchored in history is so powerful because it gives one identity it gives one a sense of purpose and meaning in life and in school as as a learner and i think that's why history is so important because at the end of the day history is not just simply about who discovered a or b history is about the totality of a people's lived experiences and this is about our achievements and contributions. It's about our resistances. It's about our struggles. It's about our failures. And it's about our successes. And being able to navigate that and teach that as a way to strengthen the learners uh, meeting the contemporary challenges. Right? Uh, and then when I was making the point about the past, present, and future being a continuum, right? To me, teaching history is also being able to reclaim our past and not just reclaim the past, to reflect on the present. So when we talk of African history month, for example, why we may want to argue that, why are we going to have only African history month as February, but not something which is entire, and actually throughout the, the year. And I think that critique, we should offer that critique. But I also want to take the position that when we have these movements like African history month, right, it's a time for us as a people to reclaim our past, to reflect on the present, and to project onto the future, right? So it's it's, it's end with. On the one hand, we have the 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 the, the, the resistance to and, and and the struggle to make it inclusive in in the entire school system throughout the year. But at the same time, even in the absence of that, to take that moment, to take that space, to take that period, to reclaim, reflect, and project on, on our existence as a people. Mm -hmm. And I think like, again, as going, going back to the previous um, question there, but also noting that we do have to begin with ourselves and some of this decolonization mm -hmm. and realize where we're coming from. Um, at this point, there's so many questions. I'm so sorry we didn't get to them. Um, I'm going